Hey everyone, welcome to Celluloid Consomme. This is my second interview now with uh, some really, really interesting uh, filmmakers who got their start in the early 90s. Uh, that is kind of a along the lines of the shot and video horror wave that happened between the, the 80s and the early 90s, maybe mid 90s. And that's uh, Brent and Blake Cousins, who have just recently gotten their very, very hard to find uh, shot in video <laughs> horror movie, Slaughter Day, through Visual Vengeance, uh, through Wild Eye Releasing. And I have to say, I don't think I would be able to see this movie had it not been for Visual Vengeance to put this out, because this movie is a fucking blast. <laughs> It's very work to do anyway. Old abandoned cabin needs a lot of work done to it. Did you see Jones disappear like that? Crazy, stupid, heavy. Dang! You will die by the wrath of the Necronomicon. Don't let me go! Oh. No fear, no babes, we're hurting now. You must have to me, man! Oh, I have no attitude, Paul! This guy's not kill the Like, I wished it was longer, uh, and I might ask you about that at some point later. But first of all, I just want to thank you guys for meeting with me and talking about Slaughter Day. Um, so um, welcome, Blake and Brent Cousins. Good to be with you, Ivan. Hey, thanks for having us on. Appreciate it. It's been a long time since we yeah. uh, made Slaughter Day. And, you know, it's kind of interesting that it's being able to see uh, be seen for the, you know, the first time in almost 31 years. So it's incredible. That's exactly how old I am too. So uh, <laughs> I, hopefully not to make you feel old, but <laughs> I uh, just thought it was interesting. That's amazing. That's great. The new young audience is appreciating yeah. the OG. Yeah. And that's what definitely. I'm liking there. Yeah. Uh, sure. I, I have a soft spot for uh, movies that definitely have their influences and their hearts on their sleeve. And Slaughter Day certainly has that. It's a, uh, it's, no secret that this is very heavily influenced by evil dead um I, i'm sure everyone was at a certain point after they'd seen that for the first time um and beyond that um were there any other influences that that you guys had maybe while writing the film or on the set where you figured we have to have this in our movie yeah i, I would kind of say um i like the wide angle of Lens. And there's a movie that came out during those times when we're filming Slaughter Day, El Matarachi by uh, Robert Rodriguez as well. Had these kind of like nice, fast camera shots with the wide angle so you could capture everything and do these little subtle movements on there where you really don't need tracking because the wide angle gives us like smooth camera action. So that was uh, incorporated a lot, just Robert Rodriguez, Sam Raimi techniques throughout the film. We try to try to emulate what we're looking at growing up as kids. And uh, those are great examples of films to to look at and to kind of like create your own style behind it. Yeah, you know, yeah. when we're, uh, you know, James Cameron comes to mind, Aliens, when uh, that came out, we didn't even realize that was a sequel to Alien. And we realized when we're in the theater, like, we're like, oh my God, this is that movie we saw in the 70s. Are we sure? Are you sure we're ready for this? Because that last one scared the shit out of us. And then when we got out of the theater after we watched Ellen's, we're like, yeah, we we made it through. We survived. We survived. <laughs> and we're not afraid of these scary movies, but the action and the powerhouse, mm -hmm. the way uh, James Cameron presented it. We took all these aspects of, yeah, all these directors, Sam Raimi, including Evil Dead and, you know, all the stunt work that Bruce Campbell was doing. We're like, well, you know, these guys were young. They're putting it all out there. And, mm -hmm. you know, Bruce Campbell wasn't doing any, uh, getting any stunt doubles. He did it all himself. kind of like yeah. what we're doing uh, on Slaughter Day. Yeah. It, it's interesting you bring up uh, 
Cameron and Aliens, because now that I think about it, uh, there is a very much a feeling of um, almost a crossover of like the splat stick from Sam Raimi's Evil Dead days and also that uh, balls to the wall action feeling that you guys have in Slaughter Day, where when everything has gone wrong, like the shit has already hit the fan, which is so <laughs> pretty early. Um, there's there's a feeling like there's a chase sequence uh, on foot. There's a driving chase sequence. And there's even like some moments where it seems like, uh, and I did want to ask you about this, if there was any like martial arts choreography, because like there was some like actual fights in the movie. Um, but yeah, it, it's felt like such a great, unique and just unified pastiche of, of everything that we love as not even just horror fans, but genre fans in general. Well, it, it's interesting. It did take us about a year to uh, complete the film and we're filming them on the weekends. Brent was a lifeguard and, uh, you know, when Brent had his uh, time off every weekend, we'd get all our uh, friends together, the cast members for the certain sequence we're going to shoot. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we only had a weekend to shoot. We figured we'd get about two or three minutes a day. Let's just powerhouse it with as much action as we possibly could. And then we get done with the shoot and then think about exactly how we're going to sh shoot next weekend to do another powerhouse. And with these fighting sequences, you know, we grew up in Hawaii. We're kind of the minority. And, uh, you know, we, you know, we grew up in public schools. We're the only kind of Caucasian kids in, in these schools. So we had to deal with a lot of uh you know, things that uh, come up with being a minority. And there was a lot of defense and fighting going on throughout our childhood. So we, we, uh, you know, we were constantly uh, in fights, but then we, we uh, took Aikido for about four years and we constantly watch these black belt theater movies every Friday It's called black belt theater. So we loved all these Chinese films that were coming out and uh, you know, we're just constantly sparring and fighting, make, uh, making that this choreography of, these fight sequences. So when we brought it to the table, yeah, we were, we were skilled in fighting. So we knew how to get that, that look. And it's up to Brian as a director to angle it perfectly where when that impact hit it, you know, connected. We also put squibs in our hand mm -hmm. and put a pin prick in the squib. So right at the punch, you'd squeeze your fist and keep your knuckle a little open. So it could eject out the fake blood as you hit oh, it cool. in real time. So you'd get all this effect. And then the actor would have blood at the same time in his mouth. So when he combined both at the same time, you get this spectacular uh, splatter fest, fist yeah. to the face punch. It definitely worked to the maximum effect there. Um, <laughs> I, I will say that like the angles chosen and the sound design for, in particular, that one guy, um, I, it, it's been a little while since I had seen the movie for the first time, but uh, one of the construction workers who has like this really mean spin kick <laughs> that was excellently done and like he didn't look like he was getting tired of kicking anyone over yeah and he over kept again. doing that spin kick and we're yeah. like well he, he keeps doing it and he keeps like knocking people out it's like well let's have him do a spin kick and blake's gonna catch it and then he's mm -hmm. gonna break his leg right at that it's like none of that spin kick shit anymore <laughs> yeah so uh yeah that was like <laughs> it only worked so far like uh you know daniel son from the karate kid he could mm -hmm. only do the crane kick once but and he kept doing it. it's like nope not this time and then we did this uh <laughs> prosthetic it's kind of a real time shot too we had that prosthetic yeah. leg where his other leg was hidden and he just grabbed it and we, i yeah. forgot what we had in there is filled as the bone but yeah look it gave that perfect crunch yeah. we love breaking bones and yeah I, I loved it real that time. that definitely made me wince it was um it was very, very effective. And uh, oh, yeah. And then he actually uh, twisted his uh, ankle and his leg back into shape in real time. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Once yeah. you're possessed by the mask, you, you're you pretty much a superhero. You're unstoppable. And yeah, that's one right. of the things when, when we were kids, we we're thinking, well, what's up with these horror movies? Why don't they just cut, kill the guy? Because every time they kill him they're like and then it's a pop-up scare why don't you just chop them up in pieces and separate it and it, it, you'll never have to worry about it but with slaughter day we kind of did that thing before terminator 2 where you know liquid metal man would be able to still uh transform back into mm -hmm. a whole being and with slaughter day it was interesting to bring an element before i i've never seen it ever in cinema where it would actually cut his arm off he'd reattach mm -hmm. attach it and there's points in the movie we just wanted to separate his body parts just so you know john jones couldn't uh you know keep on i like the way like we cut him up into pieces and he really doesn't care john jones has ability yet yeah, to put himself together but he'll actually grab his own limb 
his mm -hmm. severed arm and use it as a club yep. and bash people, bash people in the head with it. I've never seen anything like that before. We thought that was pretty unique for sure. Yeah, you definitely do that in the movie where um, I think one of the main characters has his like leg ripped off, is beaten with it like while well, he's just kind of helpless on the ground. I think he puts on the mask and then reattaches the limb just so he can do that. Uh, and that kind of leads me into my next question because th there's a lot of dismemberment in this movie and um, rememberment. But uh, <laughs> there you go. Well, was, was there like that's a good one. Remember me. Yeah. That's awesome. And did you guys have any effects that you knew that you wanted to do for the film uh, before like sussing it out, or was it sort of like you're just figuring it out as you were filming, uh, or maybe you wanted to have some sort of action happen and you thought, uh, wouldn't it be cool if during some of those scenes we we had to prepare definitely because. It had to be uh, strategic on how we did some of these uh, real-time amputations. So we'd have to go in, in that house, these abandoned houses, and cut holes into the floorboards and have somebody else underneath mm -hmm. the, the floor, the uh, underneath the house with big blood bags and squibs squirting these up above it so it looks like blood splattering. But yeah, you had, to, you had to think creatively to create these kind of illusions, these magic tricks that we're trying to pull off. I was just thinking the other day, and I'm like, how did we do this one sequence where actually, I think it was me or Joseph, the heroes, has an axe. And there's this one shot where he uses the axe to cut off John Jones's head in a real mm -hmm. sequence. And it comes by his throat. You see the splatter. And then you see John Jones's head uh, drop. And then the, the remaining torso beheaded remains. And we did this in one sequence shot where the camera slides in real time as the slash and it was almost like a ballet and a dance to uh, pull some of these uh, effects off and kind of thinking out of the box because when you're doing things practical and you really don't have a budget for you know trying to make these prosthetics we're actually using john jones's real head and he's kind of in the background and we tell him okay you fold your head back and drop and then somebody else is playing john jones's torso and then somebody else is there with a squib pressing the explosion at the same time and to choreograph that. So that's the kind of techniques we did throughout. Plus, uh, you know, our short films that we did in the eighties, I think we started in 88 with Slaughter Day one, two, three, and four through 89. We were kind of fine tuning our little, uh, our, you know, techniques of these, uh, you know, delimbing in what would you call it? Re oh, remembermint. <laughs> Re <Yeah. laughs> or, or reliving. So then for, for those effect shots, uh were there any ones where you, you had to just keep trying them over and over again? Or did you did you guys get lucky most of the time? Yeah, absolutely. Some of these uh sometimes you'd have these squibs ready to blow and they wouldn't kind of like uh perform the way we had liked. So mm -hmm. definitely there's retakes and um some I would have liked to have been a little bit more bloodier, but mm -hmm. you, you just go with uh, what you got and you move on to the next shot. But there was definitely uh, takes being done over and over again. And we're filming in these kind of rough conditions, these abandoned houses and everything's kind of dangerous all around. There's nails sticking out mm -hmm. of the walls. And yeah. so, uh, yeah, some sometimes it wasn't comfortable filming these scenes and for the actors to be uh, putting these positions. Like John Jones, when he got split in half and taken down into the Necronomicon, uh, that yeah. had been done a few times too. And he had to arch his back and all this weird, these weird angles and uh, positions of your body. So yeah, it, there's a, it's a good commitment by by our actors to actually put put themselves in these situations sometimes. And we also, <laughs> uh, you know, there was sometimes no room for mistakes. And, mm. you know, we had to really enforce upon our actors uh, you know, if you blow it here, somebody could get seriously injured and go to the hospital because uh, some in some of the sequences we're using actually real machetes and real axes. So in one sequence, when John Jones uh, uh, piles down with his machete and starts to stab his it's brain. Actually, yeah. In the beginning of the film, John Jones comes in and stabs my leg and I have this prosthetic, my legs buried into the ground, and then we'll create a prosthetic up to his knee. Yeah. And uh, he's got to hit position up. Uh, like bullseye for the blood bag right. so it's only oh. inches from his knee if he really does it so some of these takes we really wanted to get it done once because we didn't want to like start messing around 
because you know you could start getting excited and if there's no he actually hit the spot and i saw that the blood didn't hit it uh it didn't explode the way i like so you see in the cut I actually go there with my hands to uh, squeeze a squib to bring okay. out the blood but as i'm squeezing it i'm kind of grabbing the machete a little bit and i did cut my fingers up oh and, uh, so I, yeah, well, I injured myself for that shot. <laughs> it seems like it, it lended a sense of authenticity to it. Uh, hopefully, it wasn't a bad cut, though. It was okay. Yeah, it I, been I worse. was bleeding. Was, There's some blood on set, but it wasn't too bad. Yeah, I've had the work. adrenaline was going. Brent just wanted to see yeah. more blood, and he's like, Ugh! and then he's like, "Oh shit!" <laughs> You're just grabbing it like a little bit harder than anyone. I just go for it. Go life. for yeah. it. <laughs> Not thinking. Yeah. About John Jones, um, I, I love the the voice that he uses, um, and I guess throughout the whole movie, he pretty much speaks the way that he does. I don't know if it's because of the gas mask or because of the possession. When the film goes into the flashback of why he feels so scornful against his bosses, he still has that same voice, and I'm just wondering why. Uh, was he just like a weird dude like that, or? We were looking for our bad guy and we we knew we wanted to fill John Jones with somebody that was, you know, strange, peculiar, bizarre. And Brent, we're at a party and Brent says, I found I we found I found our John Jones. And I'm like, oh, yeah. And he, and he says, well, here he is. And then I'm looking at him. I'm like, are you sure this is the John Jones we're looking for Brent and Brent's like, yeah, this is this is the guy he, he's committed. And I'm like, well, OK, well, let's give him a shot. And uh, yeah, he's actually a really uh, laid back his, kind of guy, his, soft spoken. His name's Sam Bluestone. He, he doesn't act any way uh, part of Jim Jones or John Jones at all. He's got his own, uh, yeah, soft persona. But when we put him in this film and we say action, he just came up with that deep growling voice. Awesome. And it, we didn't tell him to stop. We just said, <laughs> sounds good to us. <laughs> so uh, was that like, uh, in camera, then that, that he was doing that voice. Yeah, oh, yeah. yeah, that was all his okay. real voice at, in real time. Yeah, wow. mm -hmm. it, it came through like super clear through the um through the gas mask. Because I was wondering if it was like eighty yard in later or like done. Oh, that was you that... will die by the wrath of the ne Necronomicon. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that was great. No, I, I, lo I love his his villainous character. It's like um, it's almost as if. It was just a simple misunderstanding. And then he's just like really takes it too seriously and then just decides to invoke the wrath of a demon against them. So, <laughs> and look at what Visual Vengeance did. They actually made an action figure oh. off of John Jones right there. So, That's awesome. I didn't, I didn't, catch that got the that. gas mask and all. Yeah, really neat. And, and it even has a detachable arm uh, there as well. So, you could do I that. Uh, yeah. Those scenes in the movie. Uh, John Jones. It, Kind of recreated the look of John Jones. If we ever did the sequel, like I guess this would be kind of a good template for uh well, maybe not a sequel, maybe just a reboot of this uh bad boy. Practical effects. That's what people are looking for nowadays, I think. That is what we were looking for. Um, as long as it's not too time consuming or too expensive to do it, that it will completely derail production. But you know, that's the filmmaker's purview. Not the fan. We've been doing it all our life. That uh, movie cost us about six dollars in powder paint for the blood, and um, we do a lot of uh, production nowadays and pretty successful at it. And our budgets are just so minimal, but uh, the profits are pretty large. Gotta yeah, say. there's something about that do that DIY ness from Slaughter Day, where uh, when you're watching it, it's one of those movies that you can definitely identify the seams, like how some things may have been done, but the energy that you guys bring to that movie is just so, uh, I don't know, spectacular that you don't care. Like you can see how like the reattaching limbs thing actually works, you know, maybe in the edit or if there's like some like a costume change or something like that that happens in between shots. Yeah, we had like some uh, wardrobe malfunctions. Yeah. Even our main actor, John Jones, uh, you know, we're about wrapping this film up and we still had a few more scenes to film with John, uh, excuse me, uh, Sam Bluestone playing John Jones. And then he shows up on set and he's got a butch cut. And we're like, what are you, what are you doing? You, how, why'd you cut your hair in the middle of this thing? And actually, that was the biggest budget of the movie mm -hmm. is more than the powder paint. We had to go find a wig 
in the big island of Hawaii to semi match it. We've dropped 60 bucks for it and we put it on them. We're like, this looks absolutely ridiculous, but we're, <laughs> we're, we're going to have to tra- do a transition somehow or another. So we came up with a, uh, you know, a few things where John uh, Joseph Ross, who plays Joe actually rips his hair off and, you know, then we could have them as a butch cut. And there's a one time I, I, I had to get a job in the middle of making the movie and uh, I had to cut my hair and we did the same thing. I had my hair ripped off mm-hmm. just so we could uh, figure some of these inconsistencies <laughs> out for sure. Yeah. That was the thing about that sequence. I, I had thought that there was another power that wasn't uh, explained yet or that he could clone himself or something, you know, like re um, like duplicate his image. Uh, so that's what I was thinking during that sequence, like when he essentially just gets his entire scalp like ripped off almost. Um, but uh, that's interesting that, that you did mention that because it also adds another layer just showing the viewers that like they don't know the complete intricacies of how these demonic powers work. Um, like there's always something else. I don't even think John Jones um essentially knows the extent of his power otherwise i think he probably would have won by the end yeah there's a sequence where he's almost pretty much cornered um joseph ross the hero my uh you know construction frame he actually dons the mask on because he knows he has to save himself and then and then he starts beating john jones up and starts kicking his ass and then John Jones realizes he has to get out of there. And then he starts figuring out these powers where he could dematerialize into another location. And we're just kind of like making these things up as we go on uh, some of these sequences. It's but- like that uh, old TV show, Greatest American Hero, where the aliens gave him the, the costume, yeah. the superhero costume to have the powers, but he, uh, he didn't. And it didn't come with instructions. Or he lost the instructions. He lost but... the instruction book. So he's basically winging it as he goes. Through to the, the film's end. So everything's pretty much set on land until, I guess, the final sequence, which is uh, it's on a boat. And there's like an entirely new set of characters, like the captain and his number one and assistant with their, with their main heroes. Uh, I'm, I'm just wondering if if that sequence was that was that planned or did you just find out like oh this guy has a boat and he's letting he says that we can shoot on it or something it's a good question you know the whole plan was to separate john jones into different body parts and bury it in different parts of the island and we thought wouldn't it be great to uh you know the last thing that remains is his mask let's just dump that out into open water Mm -hmm. and uh, we had a friend in the neighborhood who had a boat but the deal was if we're going to get on his boat and film this action sequence, we had to work for 40 hours on his boat in dry dock. So yeah. we uh, went to the boat, uh, the boat yard in dry dock and worked and scraped and painted the and pulls off all the oh, bottom yeah. of the boat. Hard, uh, hard, oh, hot work. Yeah. Really laboring, but you know, you know, uh, Dave Anderson, the captain of the boat, you see him in the film. Uh, we got on there and then we're uh, selling his boat from one harbor to another and we had that opportunity to uh go and shoot that sequence and that was interesting there's one there's one point in uh that scene where you see um one of the shipmates get blown off the boat mm-hmm. and he, he gets shot in the head and you see him fall into the ocean that's the person that played that was our uncle johnny but he was back in california and he didn't want to go into the water so we had to actually go out on that boat one more time and the person that actually gets cast out into the water that's throwing himself out there is john jones playing okay. our uncle <laughs> shemping He's little shemping. shemping going on there <laughs> so it's like a symbolic second death for him almost <laughs> yeah yeah there you go oh and there's one scene where uh john jones get, gets his head cut off and there's some blurred blood spurting and you see uh joseph and and Blake look at each other and they're like, oh, oh my God, actually that's me popping up so I could get myself in a another cameo in there. So I actually uh, shemp Blake in that scene and nobody ever- We're identical we're twins, identical so twins. nobody, I can't even tell. It's like, oh my God, that's that's Brent. I I, I thought it was Full me. Full face, you can't even tell, it's right almost. there. It shows it. So that's two like unofficial but confirmed shemps for, for slaughter. <laughs> uh, Absolutely. Right. Just to- uh, pan back out for the entirety of the film. Um, as we all know, this was shot on video. Um, 
it, it seems like the master tape has seen quite a bit of action because uh, the the transfer I think that made it to uh, here's to the, the master uh, here's the master uh, whatever you call it umatic Reed. tape. Oh, oh okay, yeah. Order, order but it was a shot on VHS, and then we uh, upgraded it to this thing just to uh, make sure we had it. But it was full of mold. It mm. was uh, really in bad shape when we sent it out to uh, Rob at Wild Eyed. And, uh, you know, they did their best to restore. There's one part where we kind of told them there's two tracks. One is a mixed track of the audio. And then there's a mono track where we do our mix with our music and uh, master audio line. You know, it's interesting because they chose to use the track that wasn't mixed properly. So you could hear Brent in the background saying go. Mm -hmm. You hear a lot of um, inconsistencies because they didn't go with our master mono track. But uh, I don't know. I would have liked it to have the master mono track the way we design it. But then it gives its own charm hearing kind of the inconsistencies with the cut you get in the yeah. Blu-ray. And that's also another thing with um, being uh, used to shot on video movies where these aren't like big Hollywood budget films. Uh, you're not going to have the, that kind of that level of consistency. And that also points to like those being able to see uh, the, the moving parts behind the camera and the seams that make the whole experience uh, a unified one. But still that, that charming energy, that humor, that action, that um, the punches that this movie brings um, really overrides that. And it's that you immediately forgive the movie for that. And like, <laughs> I think you guys just really have like the, this knack for injecting this almost like palpable energy uh, to the film. I have definitely found a new like Halloween season uh, film for rewatching and yeah, uh, for all of my friends who just like are dreading the day that I show them like a new movie that I'm in love with. To their credit, this movie is about 61 minutes long, so they won't have to watch for that much. Uh, but I, I sincerely hope that this is something that catches on um, just incredibly fast, especially with the, the new Blu-ray release. And it, it would be interesting to see if, if we could get a, a like another release with that extra like mono mix track, like you said, so at some point in the future. Because I would like to to see how how those mixes differ. Yeah, absolutely. You know, it's it's amazing just to hear the feedback thirty one years later. When we made this film, we lived here in the Big Island of Hawaii. We had no means of distribution. Uh, we weren't really connected at all with Hollywood. Pretty much impossible in our neck of the woods. So unfortunately, it kind of really went nowhere, and we could only show it to our friends and family in our close circle. So maybe until now it's like maybe only been seen by 30 or 40 people on this planet. And now all of a sudden it's uh, available for Blu-ray and uh, this younger generation such as yourself seems to, you know, pick up on this kind of nostalgia uh, as a, a, almost a, it's almost a collector's item. Like you, you say, you're going to show it to your friends, but it's so obscure. It's almost like, wow, look at what I got. You've never seen this book before. Take a Now take a look at this. This is kind of, it's kind of almost bragging right for people to have a movie like this just to share and torture their friends, whether <laughs> their friends enjoy it or not. It's still something that yeah. they've never seen before. Yeah, I and I, I do enjoy torturing them, but a little bit less now <laughs> than I did before. Because, you know, in my 30s, uh, we don't live much longer now. So, <laughs> oh, okay, you got to, you know. You got a ways to go. You I just ways. heard uh, when you in ten years, ninety is going to be like the new forty. So mm -hmm. yeah, but hopefully in ten years, Slaughter Day will be just as much as a classic as it is seeming to be right now. Uh, Hell yeah, in its heyday. So actually, we're talking with Wild Eye, and there might there there's talks of uh, maybe rebooting this thing. So oh, yeah, it'll be done on a low budget for sure, and it'll be all practical effects. Hey, give us maybe two weeks, get a little cast get out in the woods and uh go crazy find some place we could destroy and you know have fun yeah no I, i'm sure given the the audience that slaughter day is being released into i i can't imagine that um there won't be any interest or 
um, any, I don't know, lack of volunteers for sure. <laughs> Even if it's just like free PA. Any pigs. Any pigs. Yep. PAs, <laughs> AKA guinea pigs. <laughs> Whip squelters. So uh, you guys have built up a uh, production company from, from just you two from starting with the Slaughter Day short films into the full length feature. And um, it seems like you guys are doing some, some documentaries recently, like directing, producing, that sort of thing. Yeah, over the past uh, couple of years on Amazon Prime and iTunes, we had the top rated documentaries in any genre. But our genre so happens to be about the phenomenon of the UFO and technology uh, cover up by, uh, we think, a uh, private corporation. And we're talking to all these insiders in Washington, D.C. And, you know, our documentaries have blown up on Amazon Prime. The first documentary was called Countdown to Disclosure. And we did a follow up to that that just came out called Above Top Secret. Uh, the technology behind disclosure. And we feature a person in there by the name of Dr. Stephen Greer, who's kind of known as the godfather of ufology. He's been in it for over 30 years, including retired FBI agents and uh, people that work within aerospace and everything involved with the phenomenon. So, you know, it's a really big subject matter. It's being talked about in the news. And we just wrapped up our trilogy. We were in Washington, D.C., and that's uh, in the works. And it's going oh. to be uh, distributed real soon. So, okay. yeah, really uh, groundbreaking in regards to this cover up of the secret technology. So, you, yeah, you it's, it's an amazing thing. But we we definitely want to roll into maybe getting our uh, getting into that blood and fun stuff and action sequence. Mm -hmm. We're kind of hungry and biting at the bit, ready to start making another feature film and move away from documentaries just for a little bit. Okay, cool. Yeah, just just plunge back into like narrative films, that sort of thing. Absolutely. But you know, the the above top secret and our new movie coming out called Endgame to Disclosure is uh pretty groundbreaking and uh it's gonna open up some eyes and uh, get people wondering what's going on. Is the government telling us the truth about the UFOs is it's pretty cool because when we drop these things, they go straight uh, on the front page of Amazon because the algorithm picks up. They see so many people just oh. renting this thing or, or purchasing it that it just puts us right there on the front cover of Amazon for a couple months. And sometimes they'll do even a double barrel of our, our thumbnails for the movie itself, the posters. And uh, it's just incredible that there's this new market, Amazon and all these other iTunes and streaming services that we're able to get it out there through our other uh, distribution company and uh, they do an excellent job. And yeah, it's a good uh, partnership we got. And we've been doing it for the past just two years, just dropping these uh, heavy duty documentaries that um, really are, are seeing the light of day. So yeah, pretty impressive. We're, we're really happy about that. And Rob at Wild Eyed and Visual Vengeance, what those guys are doing as far as distribution to bring mm -hmm. back these SOV videos that were obscure, bring them to light. It's an amazing thing what they're doing over there as well. Really appreciative of them reaching out to us to get this out to the world once again. Yeah, absolutely. I, I'm going to have to, um, I, I don't own a copy as of yet, but I, I will be ordering one in time for Halloween. Uh, and I, I can't wait to check out the extras that you guys recorded um because i know there's a commentary track on there as well and some other featurettes um but yeah uh it, and also I, I will be on the lookout for amazon uh amazon prime the drop for for the last documentary in the trilogy um so yeah, yeah it's a whole different style above top secret <laughs> mm -hmm. uh countdown to disclosure You'll look at it as like, these guys made Slaughter Day. It's hard to believe, mm -hmm. but uh, yeah, it's interesting. Again, we're making these documentaries. We're shooting it in about 10 days and we're done editing it in about in about 10 days. So it's about 20 days of production. And this is what you'll see. And uh, the budget, again, is this small, but the production value is this high. And the marketable uh, ability that we have you know, hundreds of thousands of people are renting and purchasing these uh, documentaries of ours. So it's quite amazing. It's exciting. Awesome. Well, thanks to you guys so much for uh, sitting down and talking to me about this 31 year old movie. Um, <laughs> this, uh, this has been Cellulite Consomme. Uh, I am Andre and um, I guess I'll see all of you some other time. Thanks. Keep thanks Andre.